Well, let me also thank the organizers for, for inviting me here to this uh, meeting. And uh, I want to talk here about optimal and variational quantum metrology with programmable quantum sensors. And um, I listed here a few collaborators. Some of them are the audience here, like uh, Raphael Kaprik and, of course, my friends at Chilla and uh, Clemens Hammer is one of the organizers here. Um, it was, on, I think, our first paper along these lines. So uh, let me give you a little bit of background because I'm somebody who sort of works at the interface of quantum simulators and, and quantum sensors. And I think that this is somehow very important to understand what I would like to talk about now in the following. So um, I would simply say that you know, when we speak about, for example, quantum metrology, one of the, let me simply call it the fundamental challenge that we would like to address is this, that for a given sensing task, you know, uh, it's uh, somehow context dependent, we would like to identify and eventually also build something that comes close or is the optimal sensor allowed by quantum physics. So these are the best performing sensors that physics allows. And uh, very clearly, this has a lot to do with engineering and manipulating large scale entanglement. And so there's a very clear connection between quantum information and quantum metrology. And of course, this is a very old story, but we would like to you know, come from the point of view of actually trying to come up with schemes where you can do these things in the lab. Uh, two remarks here. There's sort of a hardware side to the whole story. And of course, I'm interested in AMO platforms. I mean, we have atomic clocks. We don't have a superconducting clock, for example, you know. Uh, so from this point of view, I think that atoms are ideal. And I will tell you a little bit the story that for me personally was kind of the insight from the programmable quantum simulator to the programmable quantum sensor. Uh, of course, this should be seen in the context of variational quantum algorithms for metrology. Uh, again, many of these ideas have been inspired coming from the quantum simulation context, but we'd like to export them now to quantum metrology. And I think that this is, for me, actually a great example that should be quite relevant in the lab in a broader context. So I'm showing you here some pictures that probably have seen in different form uh, earlier. I know of Rydberg atoms, Hubbard models, superconducting qubits are sort of honorary members of the community here. And of course, strapped ions as strings and now also in 2D, we heard about uh, large scale systems yesterday of, uh, I don't know, 100, and then even the word uh, 1,000 atoms was mentioned over here, or ions. The great thing about these programmers, quantum simulators, is the fact that they scale to very large particle numbers and also entanglement, and we have, of course, limited programmability. So in talking about these things, we're kind of trading between, you know, the, uh, let's create uh, very large systems with a lot of qubits or spins that are entangled while at the same time we have some programmability, but it's kind of a trade-off in finding the sweet spot. And I think that this is sort of what's going on experimentally right now. I think that September 28th was actually a great uh, day for this uh, enterprise here, because we saw here, you know, three papers coming out in Nature at the same time. You know, here, um, Kaufman and uh, also Junier here, realizing spin squeezing with Rydberg interactions in an optical clock. I mean, that's exactly what we talk about. These systems, Rydbergs have been developed in the context um, of quantum simulation. Think about the great experiments done at Harvard and uh, also in France. Uh, we have here another paper uh, uh, collaborating between Anna Maria and uh, Christian Ross uh, with trapped eyes in Innsbruck, quantum enhanced sensing. You know, and they show you also squeezing in this context. And of course, uh, then a similar article from Antoine Provet's group. So you can see these are systems that we normally discuss in the quantum simulation context. They're pretty scalable to large systems. And uh, as I said, have some programmability. And um, so this is sort of setting the stage that we think now how we can use this uh, to at the end really can we go beyond the spin squeezing and sort of go close maybe eventually even to what we call the optimal quantum sensor using these ideas as a kind of a toolbox. And um, we wrote a few papers the last few years. The first one was actually inspired when I visited Chilla and uh, Adam Kaufman was talking about, oh, I got my Rydberg interactions, but they're finite range. Can we nonetheless get squeezing? Anna Maria had her ideas uh, along these lines. And then we wrote a series of papers where we kind of realized what we should do with variational algorithms is not only optimize particular states like squeeze states, you know, what the game usually is at the moment, but actually, the whole uh, quantum metrological sequence, which in the case over here was really a RAM interferometry. So we came up with ideas, you know, on the, on the theory side, developing all of that, which became uh, with trapped ions uh, experiments, and then sort of there's sort of theory after that, you know, they talked about vector field sensing and so on. So it was optimizing the whole interferometer 
And this is really going from, you know, outline over here, entangler decoder. I will explain what these things are and then going to concrete experiments uh, that we have here. So um, given this stage, what I would like to do now is sort of go a little bit back and tell you why I believe it is a good idea to think about this interface between quantum simulators, you know, from many body physics, but then uh, also using them as platform and also programmable platform in the context of quantum metrology. So when we talk about quantum many body physics, we talk about these programmable analog quantum simulators over here. Uh, you can see that I just mentioned before that we have Britberg three arrays, we have trapped ions. If I take the trapped ions as an example, and my colleague Rainer Blatt is down in the basement with a machine like that, you have a string of ions over here, or now uh, in new days actually two-dimensional even, you know, with um, 100 qubit or maybe more. In the case that I'll talk about afterwards, will be 51. And they naturally realize this is sort of the native Hamiltonian, the transverse Ising model with a with a, a transverse field B over here, having long-range interactions. And uh, you know, for infinite range, this would be just a one-axis twisting Hamiltonian that we like to have, for example, uh, to, to generate uh, uh, one-axis twisting and therefore screen squeezing uh, in the lab. And very similar on the Rydberg side. But uh, the point of the story is this, that we want to look at these you know, Hamiltonians that we have over here, much more in the following is kind of a building block for um, you know, uh, somehow constructed circuits. And the circuits, you know, we, we're going to optimize in such a way that you get squeezing that or the performance of your whole interferometer that goes beyond what we have in the case of the spin squeezing. This will be the whole story. So these are native Hamiltonians, but we will just downgrade them to be very good, uh, high fidelity uh, N particle gates where N can be very, very large. So they're scalable and programmable, but not universal. So what do I mean now by talking about the variational approach to quantum antibody physics for programmable quantum sensors? Uh, you know, uh, what you can do, as I just said, is this, that you can build now simple circuits, like, you know, you got a string of ions or, or Rydberg atoms and whatever. You can entangle them up, but now using the native Hamiltonian and make several layers and generate, depending how long you switch on these interactions over here, these are single particle rotations that we have here. You can generate a family of wave function that depends on these parameters. And uh, experimentally, we'll see now in a minute that we can go to circuits that are, you know, um, not only just one few, but actually several of these layers over here. And uh, what you do in variational algorithm, and we learned this, of course, from the people doing normally quantum computing, but we kind of repeat it here in the context of quantum simulation that you can do run now, for example, here in these machines, a variational quantum eigen solver. This always comes down to optimizing a cost function on a classical computer, you know, interacting with your quantum device. So there's an optimize the cost function, the quantum feedback loop. What you would do there is this, that you write down on a piece of paper, your target Hamiltonian can be some many body Hamiltonian, whatever you want. Um, and then you identify, you know, the cost function, for example, I would like to get the ground state, uh, minimizing this energy. And then what you have to measure over here in this feedback loop is all of the correlation functions that are these expectation values for these terms that we have over here. This is a standard story. Uh, uh, the great thing is that in the lab, when you do these things for a very large number of particles, very often the experimentalists cannot really calibrate their uh, native Hamiltonians very accurately. But it turns out that these algorithms here are very robust against coherence design errors. So this robustness is exactly what will save us at the end, and that's a very important feature. Okay, so let me give you an example that hopefully convinces you, and then we are going to start about metrology, sort of, you know, inspired that this uh, might be an interesting idea. Uh, we just had a paper out uh, recently where we took something like this. Okay, we take a string of 51 ions, you can see them down here. Uh, it is a programmable quantum simulator realizing a transverse Ising model natively, but let's uh, search for the ground state of this Heisenberg uh, model over here, maybe even at the critical point where we have then here these conformal field theories. And uh, when you look at uh, this Hamiltonian over here, what we do is exactly what I said before. We design a circuit. We're not going to explain it over here, mi minimizing the energy. And what you then get is, well, a series of trajectories. This is sort of the cooling, how the classical search algorithm finds you. And uh, I find it actually quite amazing that uh, when you look at the final result over here, one gets, you know, if you look at the spectrum of Heisenberg model from lowest to the highest, you get within about 2% uh, close to the to the real ground state, even though this is 51 ions, so this is a rather shallow circuit. And so this has very few uh, variational parameters, only so five layers and actually 10 parameters. It's almost nothing, you know, it's uh, very cheap in this sense, okay? Uh, we get these results and I think they are great. What we did in the paper was, of course, that we took this thing as a starting point to 
investigate entanglement structure for low-lying states or for high-lying states, but that's not the purpose of my talk here today. Um, let me also mention that, you know, as part of developing this whole toolbox that goes around it, uh, Rick van Beinen developed the optimization algorithms running on the classical computers that uh, do a global optimization in the noisy landscape. Noise is very important. You know, we have a single quantum system. We are doing single shot measurements and we get all of the statistics. So you have to optimize between would I like to find my lens more accurately in terms of parameter space or in terms of nailing down the error that corresponds to the shot noise. So these things are, have been highly optimized over a few years. And this is sort of the setting where we'll say, well, 51 ions, you know, we, I'm sure we can do this thing for much larger systems and also 2D and so on. So let's now take these ideas and switch over to quantum metrology and ask to what extent we can export both the hardware, but also then, of course, the, the uh, related software that we have to adapt now in terms of variational to, for example, quantum interferometer. The quantum interferometer, I'm just drawing here Ramsey, you know, pi by two pi's, closing the interferometer over here, you're printing a phase. This is parameter estimation of some phase phi. Could also be a, a vector, a multi-parameter if you want. Um, and then we have, if you have uncorrelated atoms, this defines the quantum uh, standard quantum limit in terms of the noise property of the signal that comes out. And uh, of course, when we entangle, we go beyond the standard quantum limit. And this is a conceptually very old story written up in all of these uh, reviews down here. And some of these experts, of course, are here in the audience. Uh, what we would like to do, and it's sort of you know, obvious from a quantum information point of view, we're just writing down a circuit now where we have Instead of the pi by two pi, it's an entangling circuit over here. We call this an entangler generating the input state. This is entangled, and we would like to optimize this thing at the end. And we also would like to have general uh, measurements over here. So these are then entangled measurements. And we would like to find that the optimal RAM interferometer. This is something that theoretically you know, was identified some time ago, but we would like to build it actually in the lab. And uh, so what we would like to do now is to define variational classical quantum algorithms where we identify a certain metrological cost function. They might ask what should it be, what, what will it be, over all possible you know, circuits that are within the ones that we can realize experimentally. And this will include the squeezing circuits. This can include, of course, single particle rotations, and you can layer them together, building up rather complex circuits and optimizing over all of them. We would like to find then the best performance uh, operate uh, uh, um, uh, interferometer. And uh, this defines, uh, is defined by a metrological cost function. So I'm always saying that, you know, the way that I look at it is like this, that when we talk about the metrological cost function, we sort of have an imaginary discussion with our experimental friend that we ask him what do you care about, you know, and what you measure, uh, give me a wish list. And of course, the first thing on the wish list would be signals to noise, but there could be more things down here, like motivated with an atomic clock that you might have a very large dynamic range. And then we would like to optimize now this interferometer, giving a cost function that you know, summarizes the list of wish lists that the experimental friends have. And then we ask him, you know, what kind of resources you have available. And then you, what you would do with these resources is that, okay, oh, here's my pointer, is that you set up a series of these variational gates, very similar to what we talked about earlier. And then you would like to optimize. And so we have experimental resources that entangle, and we would like to use these resources to get the best performing, you know, interferometer given my wish list that I have that I formulated as a cost function. Okay, uh, it's sort of non-trivial to do this kind of a feedback loop because notice that we're optimizing here a quantum process and no longer a ground seat or something like this. So in principle, this is sort of much more complex what we do. Let me give you a slightly sort of a different perspective from the angle of uh, Bayesian uh, metrological cost function. Uh, what we actually do is this, that if you look at the example of an atomic clock, and the paradigmic example is that I got one atomic ensemble that I coupled to the, the oscillator that I would like to, uh, like to lock to an atomic transition. Uh, you know, one paradigm is to look at single shot measurements where you have an ensemble. And, uh, you know, you go in with a prior knowledge that you have a diffusing laser phase that goes out and it has a certain width. And what you are then asking is this, that you make a certain kind of measurement that you would like to optimize. This was our last circuit that I showed you before here. Uh, to sort of optimizing how much information gain we have over here. And this is what we identifies a cost function. The cost function is simply that we would like to maximize the information gain, you know, over here um, in, for example, single shot over here. But this is written out explicitly and it's just intuitively corresponds to, uh, you give the prior and within the prior, what is the optimal scenario in terms of all of the gates that gives me the minimum posterior width and this is the cost function that we would like to minimize. 
And of course, you do that this and variationally, that you have a constraint optimization by just going over the class of circuits that you would like to optimize for. Uh, let me just uh, add one remark over here that um, this is Bayesian, and of course in Bayesian, I talked about single shot measurement over here. We can also do many measurements where, of course, this posterior distribution of our phase will sort of narrow down, narrow down, and think about this thing also as being a multi-parameter scenario where we might measure magnetic field or whatever. Then the Bernstein from Mises theorem tells us that, you know, with certain uh, comments as a, as a footnote that uh, this comes uh, to, be a, to be a Gaussian by the number of measurements over here. So uh, uh, is, is this number K? And you can see that the covariance uh, matrix that appears in this Gaussian, uh, find out is sort of the real value where this thing is finally circling in, uh, is given by this uh, Fisher information matrix down here. And you can see at that point, you know, when you write it like this for many, many measurements, you're making contacts with the frequencies, so this Fisher approach where we have the well-known gamma, rao, uh, inequality, all of that. And this, of course, I guess that Augustus Merzi will talk about some of these things and later on. Uh, it's very interesting to, to connect with what Augusta has done in the following sense that, you know, uh, he's written down uh, very similar um, kind of inequalities over here, but looking at higher order derivatives over here, you know, in your recent PRL that you had. And uh, what this thing does is, for example, very often uh, it solves the following problem. Um, you know, many people might think that, well, the way of optimizing an interferometer, optimizing a sensor in general, is to optimize your, your Fisher matrix or your Fisher information over here, okay? But notice that this thing is a local quantity, and uh, very often if you just optimize Fisher, you know, in the multi-parameter context, it is not unique. Uh, actually, the Bayesian solution over here, you know, starting with a finite dynamic range, sort of going down here, where this thing finally uh, circles in, uh, sort of selects among all of these degenerate Fisher sensors, the one which really is optimal in terms of sort of the broadest region of uh, uh, distinguishing different parameters. So it's somehow special, and I think it's very much linked to what uh, Augusto will talk about from, from his point of view, of course, coming from, uh, from this uh, Fisher world. Okay, so let me now sort of walk you a little bit, and then at the end show an experiment. This is the most trivial example. This was also the one done experimentally, but I think it's just right for the talk that I'm giving here. Uh, right now, uh, the other things get uh, sometimes pretty complicated. When you have a ramp interferometer and you talk about entangled decoder, and you have a free evolution here, you're making your measurements read up, up and down, like you always do in an interferometer. And of course, you get based on this a certain statistics, how many of these atoms, you know, that you measured over here are up and down. And so this corresponds to the probability of given a certain phase that you imprinted over here. Uh, you measure how many atoms up and down. This is the parameter M over here. This is the quantum mechanical amplitude for this transition here uh, squared. This is a probability for that. And of course, the well-known examples that we have over here is this, that if I take a coherent spin state, which is a product state, the one that we define as a standard quantum limit, you can see this uh, you know, uh, distribution that we have over here. Physically, it corresponds to having a coherent state on the Bloch sphere, which is rotated you know, by the phase phi, the resolution obviously given by the, by the width you know, of this circle that we have here on the Bloch sphere. And you can see that, you know, in the counting statistics here, this has a certain bit, so this is then by the estimator projected down to give you the posterior uncertainty that we have over here. And if you go through this whole thing, and this is, of course, the standard and well-known standard quantum limit that we have over here. If you do the same thing for uh, spin squeezing by adding the squeezing that I mentioned earlier, you can see that this thing gets narrower over here. And so your signal is, uh, you know, narrower over here. The signal noise improved regarding the quantity you wanted to measure. This is the spin squeezing, and we go below the standard quantum limit. Uh, let me compare this thing also with sort of what we know in this case, and uh, it's always discussed as the ultimate uh, performing interferometer, which is a GHC interferometer, uh, being a superposition of all up and all down, uh, that for pure states, of course, uh, corresponds to the quantum Fisher information, which is the largest possible over here. Uh, yes, indeed, you can see that the line is much deeper, but I also would like to point out that when you look at the uh, you know, width over here, this is the dynamic range where you can uniquely identify. If I just do a single measurement, you know, uh, you can see that the dynamic range over here, this interferometer down here can only distinguish phases, you know, uniquely within a very small interval, which is like one over n. So you gain Heisenberg limit one over n, but you also sort of lose over here. This way is out by making sort of, you know, multiple measurement scenarios uh, that have been discussed in the literature. Uh, I'll come back to some of these things a little bit later. So imagine now going back to my discussion of the cost function, if you plot now this mean squared error over here, 
uh, as a function of the phase, you can see that the GHA state is uh, Heisenberg limit down here, very low. Coherent state is up here and the spin squeezing here. You can see this is sort of setting the stage. But what we wanted to do is this, that we said, okay, can we optimize the input state and also the measurement for something which is very broad, but as deep as possible. So that's a different way um, of analyzing the problem or requiring what the cost function is. As I said, sort of relevant for an atomic clock scenario with a single ensemble that one has. And uh, this is this interferometer that we'd like to have with the best signal to noise ratio over here. And we can put this in as a cost function. So if you, uh, you know, write now down a variational algorithm, you can see what's happening here is this, that we got this RAMS interferometer and it will lead to a certain statistics having now and variational ansatz for the entangler, but also the decoder over here, leading to this uh, statistics of the, of the atoms being measured in up and down. And then this is sort of uh, projected down here by this uh, estimator. And of course, you would uh, quantify, you know, what you get over here in terms of a mean squared error, which is written here. This is the estimate, and this is the, the phase that you have, and this is weighted by these probabilities that, uh, that you get over here. And you can see that uh, in this interferometer, you might have a prior width over here, and uh, after one update, you know, one single measurement, you update this thing to the posterior function, which we have over here. And this is now the cost function that we, whose width we would like to minimize over here. So we are optimizing, as I said before, for maximum information gain on phi in a single measurement. And uh, if you run this thing in a feedback loop, then uh, you got the best, uh, you know, performing interferometer, you know, based on your cost function uh, that is allowed by the quantum resources, the entangling resources that you have in your lab. At that point, you can think about real systems and uh, the example we thought about, and Raphael wrote down all of these circuits, these are squeezing elements over here that you squeeze together. It has to do with picking the right symmetries, uh, some details over here, and so on. And you have some hardware. Uh, we have rotations. We have one axis twisting. This is the input. Let's find now what the optimal interferometer is. And I want to emphasize that in doing so, uh, we cannot only do that, of course, on the IAM platform that I talked about, but this is really universal, you know, and uh, there's a lot of uh, different papers and ideas around how to generalize this thing, and I think that Rootbergs are particularly interesting because of the 2D character and also running at the moment as an atomic uh, clock based on the Chiller experiments. So um, let me now come to an experiment that demonstrated this thing last year. Uh, this was together with Christian Roos and, and Rainer Platt in Innsbruck. That we had the collaboration. And so if I start out, you know, with a, a standard quantum limit interferometer over here, and I'm plotting here the usual interference fringe that you can see, and down here I'm showing the noise properties as a function of the phase. Remember that this is the prior that we're putting in. We are putting in a Gaussian that has a certain width. This is what we specify. We would like to optimize the interferometer in this given range given by this Gaussian over here. And this is the mean square error, uh, you know, here for the standard quantum limit. If I put in here a squeezing circuit, you know, it's not the standard squeezer, but sort of the one that we're going to iterate afterwards as a circuit. Uh, if you put in a squeezer, you can see spin squeezing state over here. We call it the one zero because there's one over here. There's no decoder yet at the end. You put this thing at the very beginning. You can see the interference frames doesn't really change, but you can see that the noise goes down. And I emphasize that this is really theory experiment comparison without any free parameters. So the machine really does what it's supposed to do. And um, so this means that entanglement increases the sensitivity around, you know, phi equal to zero in this case, and this interval will be specified. But if you add now a coherent spin state over here, you know, this is, uh, let me see, this is a coherent spin state at the very beginning. This is a product state, but you add now a decoder to the whole story. So what does a decoder over here do? Uh, this is optimizing the right measurement, and you can see that uh, the decoder sort of, you know, becomes sensitive to the fact that we were asking for this interval that we have over here as broad as possible. We wanted this thing to be as deep as possible and as broad as possible, and the decoder sort of, you know, makes this thing broader, basically. And uh, that's uh, sort of the story, of course, that we would like to hear. Decoding increases the dynamic range. And now you can go to the next point where you add an entangler as well as a decoder and you optimize the whole circuit. And you can see now that indeed, you know, the dynamic range, you can see this is more like a triangular dependence up here becomes very broad, but this thing also goes very deep at, at that point down here. This is what we want. So that's an experimental example. Of course, we really would like to do this, uh, these things for much larger systems, more atoms and so on, but I think there's some reasonable prospects for that. So entangling and decoding increases sensitivity and dynamic range. Uh, just a little bit more on what this experiment um, actually looks like. 
So if you plot here the prior width and here you plot this sort of uh, information gain that you have, uh, sort of the lower you are, the better uh, it is over here. Uh, so it's one of the information gain. You can see that this is for, there's an optimum prior over here that in the interferometer is also setting the time, how long you have to switch on uh, the debate between the two Ramsey biases over here. And uh, you can see that uh, these are standard quantum limit, the uh, blue curve up here, then going down here. And you can see that, you know, theoretically, the optimal sense allowed by quantum mechanics is the one on the dashed line here. It's known from the literature, and we are getting very close uh, over here. And these are the experimental points. So this is theory, and this is the experiment over here. Uh, so it's pretty close to, you know, to the, uh, so a short depth circuit that we have over here already produces very close to the optimal quantum uh, interferometer allowed by quantum mechanics. This was one of the message that we have over here and this optimal uh, quantum interferometer was uh, discussed in this paper, uh, which is over here, but without giving a, an, you know, a way of actually implementing these things. Uh, just one sentence about, you know, the inside, you know, what does this, uh, you know, machine actually produce in terms of, you know, what kind of quantum states and measurements are being produced, okay? Uh, you said five minutes extra? Or? No. Oh, okay, okay, good, okay. So we have a Wigner distribution over here. This is the standard squeezing. You can see this is the Bloch sphere. And what's plotted on the Bloch sphere is also that we have here a Wigner distribution for the measurement. And if you look from the top of the Bloch sphere, where this ellipse over here, now you can see it from the top, you can see that the standard measurement, the projected measurements that we do, is this product state corresponds to these contour lines that are over here. And it is the, uh, you know, convolution between these contour lines and this squeezing over here, giving rise to this, um, you know, photon, uh, to, to the atom statistics that we have down here. You can see that the best interferometer, you know, would be the one that has now measurements that sort of go in like having, being phase states, basically phase state uh, projections here. You can see that these contour lines go in and are sort of uh, just aligned, you know, with the squeezing that we have over here. And you can see this is much narrower, and also the dynamic range increases. And our, um, you know, uh, low circuit optimized interferometer has this banana over here. And uh, but you can see that we find kind of matched pairs between this Wigner function over here and then the um, and then the input state here. So the optimizer finds sort of matched pairs of input quantum states and corresponding measurement, and they you know conspire in such a way that they get actually pretty close to the to the optimal, the real thing. You can run this optimization on the quantum machine per se. I think that's very important because eventually you would like to do that for a very large particle number, you know, where you um, cannot maybe no longer calibrate your machine. So you would like to do that, you know, without a theorist input. This is a purely experimental procedure at that point. And there's pretty good agreement, you know, between what we expect theoretically and what the machine actually finds. You know, it improves it a little bit. And of course, this point over here on the on-device optimization, you know, if I go back to my Rydberg example, I really feel that this is one example over here where we are solving a many-body problem, you know, and uh, we are solving a many-body problem here in a regime of many, many particle numbers, and we are producing something, you know, this is not only entanglement where you can talk about do I have quantum supremacy or not. This is a useful quantum advantage eventually in the sense that we are creating quantum states or processes over here that actually at the end live in a quantum machine and measure something which is a sensor. And so it's not, you know, this usual kind of discussion, can you simulate these things? Not, or yes, um, okay. And uh, so in that sense, I find that this would be an example of a useful quantum advantage that nobody would doubt that having this machine, you know, in the quantum sensor will actually help. So I have a few more topics that I just want to um, maybe mention here. You can generalize these things to multi-parameter metrology and also this relation of uh, with Hamiltonian learning. Uh, maybe I have just one minute to comment on the first one. I will show you. Okay, good. So um, this whole story that I talked about, you know, can be generalized. And we have done this uh, in papers over here, of course, to multi-parameter estimation, which is much more complicated and also much more interesting. But it's not a story that will fit here, I guess, the short talk like what I have over here. But uh, think about it, and I'm just going to show you now a few beautiful slides or animations also. Uh, think about this as being like uh, vector field sensing, like, you know, you got the B uh, vector field in three-dimensional space, magnetometry, interacting with a pseudo spin of your N uh, two-level atoms that they have. And of course, now the generators, Jx and Jy, they will not commute because we have angular momentum over here. And then finding the optimal sensor is actually, you know, a hard task. But you might repeat the story that I had before with my entangler decoder, writing down the cost function, all of these things, you know, in the way that I told earlier. 
And in this work over here, you know, we identified the optimal quantum sensor for a single measurement. We also identified variational approximations. And I just want to give you an indication of the flavor of what this thing is. You know, we define different sensors that experimentalists might build in the lab. This is the one which is the universal sensor with complete control. You can cover the whole Hilbert space if you want to. Uh, these are the sensors that are, you know, uh, we don't have, you know, but you might uh, construct a sensor like what we call a one partite sensor where you have global uniform control of all of your atoms, okay? Or you might uh, uh, do one that the ion people would like to have sort of two groups, A and B, and you can think of them like being sort of two macro spins or one, one macro spin over here. You can design skates for all of these things and then go through the whole story and ask, how close do I get to the optimal quantum sensor for uh, measuring magnetic fields over here? And again, this is kind of the story, you know, this is our maximizing the, uh, the uh, effect of, of the measurements, uh, maximum information gain uh, as a function of this prior width. You can see the curves look very similar. And you can see now the performance of different sensors over here. The more control you add, the more closer you go to the sort of optimal sensor. Uh, but let me just add one more story, namely you can sort of look at, again, interpretation of all of these input and output states. What you find, if I take a very small prior width over here, is, for example, that the input state has the form of a, uh, just a little band around the equator, and what the magnetic field does is sort of, you know, tilts it like that. And then you find that the optimal, you know, measurements over here are then this, uh, you know, kind of uh, contour lines that you can see over here. Uh, where this thing is rotated, you do with the corresponding estimator here. And so that you can see that this looks like a compass over here. So we call this thing a quantum compass. You know, it sort of tells you that if you got this estimator, you know, and you measure one of them, it's pointing in a certain field. And uh, Raphael has made this uh, very nice animation that, you know, let's do now many, many measurements, okay? So we have uh, many measurements at the beginning, but prior, it's maybe big. But now we are sort of, you know, making a measurement, so our posterior function sort of updating itself and we have like a random walk until we finally go to the point that really corresponds to the uh, to the magnetic field that we wanted to measure here for 2D. Um, as you can see that this is the initial state, you know, after three measurements, you sort of circled in over here already. And if I allow me uh, to plot this thing over here for the prior width, this is a certain prior width where you're sort of getting smaller and smaller as you update. You can see that you're circling in and you always can see the compass pointing in a certain direction over here. And uh, I like it very much, you know, if I look at my iPhone, uh, you know, I'm asking, where's my bike, you know, at the very beginning, this is the prior, you know, it's a round circle, then, you know, 1.4 meters pointing in a certain direction, you can see that this is exactly what's happening over here, that's sort of like a random walk, I mean, this is me walking towards the bike, but it's quantum, obviously quantum, okay, so conclusion and, and outlook in the story here. Uh, so we have uh, discussed the optimal quantum sensing with variational quantum circuits and uh, cost function optimized with low depth quantum circuits uh, compiled from native resources. This is our trademark, to build good quantum sensors and on-device optimization over here. That's a uh, very important element. And um, yeah, uh, and of course, what's very interesting is the fact that we can go to a re regime where we can no longer classically simulate the many body states that we want, both for the entangler, but also for the decoder. But the machine does it for us with the given resources. And I think that this is sort of the, the take home message and it would be really great to see these things actually happening on the real atomic clock. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That, it was a little bit of a long minute at the end, but uh, it was worth it. Uh, Lorenza, please. I hear you in the microphone. Well, Peter, thank you. It was beautiful. Uh, I wanted to ask two clarifications. They are related. So in the single, the simple, uh, simpler single parameter case, when you showed a plot uh, where you said that the um, performance was very close to the predicted one or the expected one, the if I understood. One, yeah. The optimal, optimal one. one. Um, since I imagine that there is noise involved, what... Uh, uh, you talk about the noise in the experiment now or the... Uh, the, the theoretical one, does it take it into account the noise? Are you comparing I mean, to we a are noisy? optimizing. This is the noise that we are plotting here, you know. Yes. This is a signal to noise. Yes. And so this is the sort of, this is the information gain that you can get. And if you add noise to the whole story, of course, your posterior, yeah. in this sense, becomes broader, okay? Yeah. So this is really, in this sense, we are looking at the noise in the sense of an optimal measurement of optimal information gain 
in the posterior with this is our cost function that we optimize over all the circuits and also the estimator. Good. Yeah? Related it. to that, uh, um, would it be conceivable to inject noise with profiles that you like, properties that you like, to see whether the response? Uh, um, I would like to. Okay, so you would like to intuition. improve the interferometer with your noise, which um, I think is probably maybe, difficult. Right? Maybe I wasn't just so ambitious mm -hmm. yet. I just wanted to gain some insight on how you know how the performance is in response. So to uh, I mean, do you understand injecting noise in order to find out you know what kind of noise uh, makes it sensitive? Yeah. To, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, you can optimize the circuits, you know, in the presence of decoherence. And the principle, what we would expect, is that you know that's an idealist statement uh, that you know this uh, variational quantum algorithm would find things like decoherence-free subspaces, you know. And uh, depending on the resources that you put in, you might be able to discover that. And uh, so, this would be one example. And uh, so, let's see if artificial intelligence and machine learning is more clever than than what we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. For, uh, this is a really nice talk. Um, so I know that the encoding part and decoding part, you did it by the variational optimization. And then we all know that vari variational optimization suffer from the barren plateau. And this is like a really big problem. Like how do, how do you yeah. know that you okay. will find It, it is solution? a problem for chemists, you know, that would like to apply the variational quantum ion solver, you know, yeah. because uh, what they of course find is that at one point they find many, many Minima, you know, and uh, right. uh, you know when they do their gradient descent, or they don't know where to go, and so on. Here, it does not matter, and it does not hmm. matter because of two reasons. Number one, we have very short circuits where we never really find that, and the second reason is maybe the more important one: if your sensor performs, you know, equally good for these parameters and these parameters, you know, you care about the performance of the sensor, and now not how it is decomposed in the different gates. So if you find many local minima, I mean, I just pick the one that I find easiest in terms of my sequence, pulse sequence that I have to apply over here. Mm. So in this sense, uh, you know, what you point out is a problem normally, right. here it becomes a feature. So, so you want to keep the circuit as short as possible, is that? That's right. right. I mean, yeah. uh, right, we want to keep, yeah, but you might still have sort of, you know, multiple solutions, but mm -hmm. pick one that you like most that is sort of easiest mm. experimentally and then this is the one uh, okay, that you would right. take, or maybe then which is the most insensitive to noise or sure, whatever. Thank you. you know? yeah, another question. Again, very inspiring talk. Thanks, Peter. Um, there are some human-found protocols that involve encoding, decoding, where those two steps are related by time reversal symmetry. So, in your machine-found uh, approaches, do you find? Interesting simple relations between those two steps that you okay, can maybe so then you use. talk about these, these anti twist, un -twist. for, for multi-parameter estimation. Yes. So uh, there's a paper in preparation, and Raphael is here, one of the co-authors of this paper. Maybe talk about you know that we would like to pick among the unit areas that we do we impose these symmetry properties there, uh, just based on these kind of arguments that that you mentioned. Okay. So. Uh, you may simply ask the machine to find it. Okay. But if you sort of know it ahead. Uh, it's very useful. So this is a paper to be published, and we could afterwards, if you want, talk about it. Yeah? But do you find it naturally in the trapped ion experiment? Like, is there a okay? So it's a usual thing, you know. If you know a symmetry and you post a symmetry, then it's usually better than searching, you know, in whatever. Uh, so uh, for us, it was sort of maybe the history, and Raphael can comment more on these things. That initially we didn't know about these papers, and sort of quite blindly, and then afterwards we found explanation for some of the results that we found just in terms of these uh, anti-unitary symmetries that you have here. Okay. So further, yeah, please. Um, in one of the earlier slides, you mentioned this robustness against coherent implementation errors yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for, for these protocols. And I didn't quite understand how this enters. Is it just because you designed I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a rather trivial statement. So for example, you know, when I, I think I mentioned it in the context also of this variation quantum ion solver, I know when you go for ground states. So if I tell you that the Hamiltonian realized that the lab is a transverse Ising model and I'm writing down this idealized Hamiltonian, this is simply not true. Okay, because in the experiments and very often experimentalists do not know it for many ions, it has bumps, you know, in all of these couplings and so on, some deformation because the ion string is maybe not aligned with your lasers and all of these kind of things. 
And so uh, the point is that uh, uh, when, when you search for the optimum, you search for what you really care about, and this is minimizing the cost function, how you decompose it. And if you also know all of the elements of your decomposition, uh, it's not important, you care about the results. And the machine finds the optimal for the thing that you care about, uh, even though you might not have a completely calibrated understanding of all of your intermediate Hamiltonians that you had there. And I think that this is one of the, the main features why things like this, in particular if you scale up to large particle number, uh, might be important. Ah, so very nice, Peter. So can you go back to the slides where you were showing these uh, different colored lines for the different... Different colored lines? For, for these encoders and decoders and then without the encoder and only the decoder. Ah, okay. Ah, do you mean the experimental um, results? Yeah. Okay. Because of course... Yeah, uh, these ones. So if you go back a couple of slides, so 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 you went from the blue to the green and the difference was... So, uh, here it was going from the, okay, uh, maybe I'll go back one more. So this is, uh, you know, standard quantum limit, yep. it's, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. 5 or 2, and this is the result yeah. over here. And then uh, I'm interested in the comparison between this and, and the this green one. Adding squeezing, you know, goes yeah. down, this is only yep. 69. So we have yeah, yeah, that's fine. And again. then you yeah. go, go down. to the next case. And then the, the next case is only a decoder, yeah. but you have yeah. a coherent input state, product exactly. input state. And my question is, how did this get better? Where did more information come from to make All the this? information is in our cost function that we asked it explicitly, you know, please optimize for those encoders, there's no encoder or entangler here, but for those decoders that optimize the cost function, assuming that we would like uh, within the Gaussian over here, roughly reflected by this width here, we would like to find here the optimal uh, decoder, you know, given uh, uh, given our our bandwidth, which was the prior over here, you know. Now that I understand. My question is, where did so, so the green line is slightly below the blue line in the middle? Where did that extra information come from? Okay, uh, I think that probably what you're really asking is, is why do we have these bumps over here, you know, in this line, which are maybe not very intuitive? Is this what you're asking? Well, as I said, my question is, in the middle, the green line is lower than the blue yes, line. Yes, but you should see these things much more as average. So. Uh, the particular shape over here, these bumps, has to do actually with the fact uh, that uh, when you do the mean square error, uh, we don't have an unbiased uh, estimator for this uh, minimal Bayesian uh, 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 mean square estimator. Okay, this, and uh, it shows up as these bumps over here. Okay. Yeah, but that, well, maybe we discuss. Yeah, okay, so, but you can see experimented uh, theory agrees, so this is sort of, in this sense, has more to do with the form Please of the estimator. Key. Right. Nice talk. Uh, at the end of the day, how much absolute advantage does your protocol offer over what experimentalists usually do? Well, I know I would say, you know, it's very similar. If you talk about squeezing for light, I mean, at what point do you have an advantage? I would say that, you know, um, when you talk about squeezing with lights, you would like to you can increase the power indefinitely and then you know, be in the standard in quantum. This experiment, like oh, in the experiment over here. Uh, but we can add more atoms, so in this sense, you know, it depends uh, what's the maximum number of atoms that you have where you can do these kind of things. Right, but in terms of this experiment, I mean... No, this experiment was a demonstration experiment, you know, I mean, we had here 16 ions over here, you know, and uh, uh, so you would like to see what the, uh, how many dBs for how many uh, atoms and, and so on. Right, I have a slide somewhere, maybe I can show you afterwards in the, in the okay, in the break. A last question. We start. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering, so experimentally you may have uh, noises that uh, your theoretical model uh, does not uh, take into account or has no ways to, uh, con con uh, to include. Uh, so the, in that case, is it possible to include some kind of uh, automatic feedback that you design? Uh, so that the system would uh, converge or would find its own way uh, to the best state. Yeah, I mean, this is what's happening over here, you know. Uh, experimentalists usually like to get rid of theorists, and this is exactly what's happening over here. <laughs> not, not physically, I mean, but you know, in a, a sense of uh, not relying on theory. This, sorry, this is what I meant. And you can see this is done for 26 ions, where, for example, the experimentalists with the trapped ions could no longer control um, or did not be, uh, uh, they were not able to calibrate the Mölmer Sörensen gate. This gives me an extra minute here. Yeah? No, Mölmer Sörensen gate. Okay. okay. 
we're no longer able to uh, calibrate this gate, but of course the machine nonetheless in the presence of noise and real uh, world decoherence was finding the optimal thing given the quantum device, including all of its error and uh, miscalibrations and so on. Okay. So this is really on device optimization without any theorists, you know, uh, giving clever advice, you know, which is then true or not. This is really what the machine gives you, but of course we can simulate that and it corresponds very close to our theoretical expectations. Okay, okay. thank you. So I'm very sorry we have to stop now, but please catch Peter in the, in the break also. Let's thank Peter for, Peter for a wonderful talk.